Well, hello, this is Peter Combs from Bitamount.com and P.L. Combs Asian Art in Gloucester, Massachusetts. And today is March 3rd, 2021. In this video, we're going to take a look at Rob Michael sales coming up over in Belgium and Bruges on the 13th and the 14th of this month. Mar in March, okay. So you, if you're if you're a Chinese porcelain buyer and a collector, and you're familiar with Rob Sales, you know the kind of things we're going to get into. Uh, he always has good things, and uh, let's jump into it. It's a, a very nice sale. We're going to do it through his website over there. He's also on Live Auctioneers and Valuable, but his site is particularly well set up to look and search and dig around on there. And I recommend you use it instead of the other sites because he has really put a lot of thought into uh, finding and seeking out the things you want. All right, and here's just a shot of a few of the things in the sale. A lot of the stuff looks like, uh, you know, the kind of high-end things he typically carries. So let's uh, click over here. Um, there's also a component of the sale that offers uh, quite a bit of uh, other other ceramics at the end. It's 95% Chinese and Japanese. I just want you to know. But there's also, he's, he's an expert on Delftware and faience and all that business, and he always has some of those. Uh, so you can you can look at those as well while you're visiting, but we're going to get started right here on this page here, Ming Dynasty, and uh, right off the bat you see two things you don't see very often is is uh, yellow enamels um, on uh, Wan Li and Tian Chi pieces, uh, late late Ming examples, and this we're going to talk about this pair of plates. They are very rare. All right, and I think the estimate on them is quite reasonable. But before we do that, I want to get into a couple of other things that I've sort of grabbed. I, my, one of, some of my favorite things that are in the sale that I liked, and everybody that watches my videos know I love ch carved wooden things. I like like uh, very personal things uh, like this, this beautiful, beautiful um, shallow uh, carving of a, a Liu Han on a spotted deer with a child raising up a peach to him. This is a beautifully done bamboo carving. It's late Ming, uh, just exciting. Exceptional patina quality, the whole thing, and it's big. This thing is 13 inches tall. This is not a small piece of bamboo because most, a lot of times, you see bamboo in forms like this. They're four, four, five, six, seven inches tall. This is a big one. It's a foot tall. It's just wonderful. It's over a foot tall, actually, but very, very nice quality. And the estimate on, I think, is pretty reasonable. Two to th two to two to four thousand euros, um, uh, but. Very rare form, beautiful condition, nicely carved, and uh, and looks to be in quite good condition all the way around. The back of it is also very nicely carved. Uh, notice the, uh, the the feather patterns they used here on the edge of the saddle, and then these beautifully deep folds in the robes and so forth, and then this uh, the horns of the deer even wrap around his back, uh, right here and all that, and then he has the the, the, the fabric for knotting his hair coming down. Just a, a lovely example. And as I said, two to four thousand euros. That's not a bad price for this at all. That's a very reasonable estimate. And then he also has this, this Lu Jing um, 17th century bamboo figure. Uh, another big one, too. This one is quite tall, uh, beautifully done, nice dark patina on it. Uh, very good detail throughout. Uh, he's bearing a rue scepter and so forth. And this very big belt with his belly, pushing it downward a little bit, giving it a sense of, you know, he's well fed. And uh, the very excellently carved folds in the robe all the way down. Notice all the folds that were carved in. Just beautifully done. And then the square-toed shoes. And uh, this thing is uh, also big, 36 centimeters tall, including its little stand, 34 centimeters without the stand. So it's about 13 and a half inches tall, roughly, with a three to 6,000 euro estimate. But again, uh, Ming bamboo is fairly rare. You most often see it, of course, in brush pots and very, very small table objects. Big figural pieces like this are unusual. Um, I, I, I don't know where they came from. Maybe both of these came from the same collection. I don't know. And then for those of you that like Swato, uh, this is a plate that should jump out at you. It's, it's, it's about eight inches in diameter, um, which is sort of small on the small side for Swato, because we generally think of them as being these very big export pieces that are, you know, 14, 15, 18 inches in diameter. This is a smaller one, but the color is highly unusual. The color on this plate is very, very unusual for Swato. And uh, I love how they did the slip decoration in white, and then they did the, use this black to create these very elongated, almost comically long beaks, and then legs to, this, to, this, to the heron or the stork. All right, heron, I guess it is. And, uh, but I like the very much this, this amber glaze 
that they use. It reminds me of Liao uh, Amber Glazes, and then it's nicely molded in relief with these rue heads running around the outside. It's very unusual to see uh, molded molded porcelains in Swato, and then this this amber color uh, slip uh, over white slip or white enamel. Just beautifully done, and uh, estimated at 12 to 1800 euros, which to me seems very reasonable. And the back of the plate, by the way, looks excellent. That's the way it should look. It's not overly uh, done up with, uh, with uh, a kiln grid on the back. It's just a bit of it, traces of it here and there. It all look legitimate. Keep in mind, though, some of the, they are today making copies of Swato pieces, and they are sprinkling, they're sprinkling kiln grid onto the bottoms to make them look old. And this is how they should look. They should really look baked in like they occurred naturally around it. Um, you want to check that very carefully. And you also see the nice radiating lines that sometimes turn up in these later Ming pieces and then gl were glazed. But that's a nice example. And it's a rare form. My goodness, that is a rare form. All right, especially in that color. Wow. And then over here to this, this great big, this is a 50 centimeter uh, charger or uh, uh, roughly uh, 19, 20 inches wide of a tiger on a Wanli dish. And this is a very fine one. They say in the description it has a little bit of a repair to it somewhere. So you want to get a little more information on that. A piece of it was reattached or something. But very rare pattern. I happen to have one of these at home. It's actually a bit larger of a tiger in the middle, too. And it also has a repair to it. But I don't care because it is decorated as well as this one and uh, very, very carefully done. And you notice how when you, when you look in areas uh, like, like uh, down here at the bottom, they did the outlines, and then they very carefully shaded them in. So there's no bleeding over of color. Uh, the decoration, uh, the, the cobalt as they layered it in, stayed within the lines that were provided which is a good si sign on these because a lot of Wanli pieces, as you all know, they tend to bleed out over the edges a bit, all right? And then the, there's even a rarer one coming up here. This is a double phoenix or twin phoenix example. It's bigger than that. the other one. I think this one is, is, is around uh, 53 centimeters in diameter. Very unusual pattern with the twin phoenixes circling the flowers, flying through the airs with the long tails coming out. Um, just beautifully done. And again, nicely outlined, nicely controlled decoration all the way around. <clears throat> and then they have this archaic uh, patterning, of course, in between uh, the dividers to the floral cartouches and uh, so forth. Very classic Wan Li, but top quality and estimated at five to 10,000 euros, but it's a beast of a plate. It's 51 centimeters. So it's, uh, um, how, how big is that? About 20 inches in diameter, roughly. All right. So uh, if you're a Wan Li buyer, you definitely want to look at that. And then on to these. These are really rare. Uh, yellow, yellow, yellow cavettoed um, with underglazed blue. And yellow and blue are such complementary colors. Uh, Monet's dining room, I think, in Juvigny was uh, uh, had a lot of yellows and blues in it because he liked it so much. It's a great color pattern for color scheme for a room. At any rate, this is a beautiful, uh, uh, a beautiful. Uh, plate. I like the molded uh, sort of lotus petal rim on it, and I particularly like the uh, figure here who's uh, uh, the, the scholar sitting by a flowering plant and the attendant is watering the plant, and it's the same on both. All right, it's a nice match pair, and you don't see pair. You don't see this pattern very often at all. You certainly don't see them in pairs very often, and uh, the estimate on it is three to six thousand euros, but for a very very rare color combination. And the previous lot to it is this. Another thing you don't see very often. Uh, these um, yellow ground melon form jars. You've seen them a million times in just underglazed blue with the, with the vines and the squirrels. There's a squirrel on it climbing the grape vines. It's a very popular pattern, but you don't see it often with a yellow ground. It's typically white with just uh, underglazed cobalt blue. This is you know white enamel with cobalt blue. Very unusual type. It's got a it's got a line in the top. I don't care. It's a rare type, and it's estimated at two to four thousand euros, which seems perfectly fine. It's a very rare thing, it really is. And then over here to the uh, uh, export uh, stuff for the Japanese market, Chun Chi wears uh, transitional period and so forth. Uh, let's see, you got the fish patterns, all the usual suspects, and then you have these transitional jars, Wushai decorated, and so forth. We're going to take a look at a couple of them, and uh, one of them is this plate. Uh, this is a very unusual plate for the Japanese market because it has, it has uh, uh, sort of these uh, uh, colored enamels along with cobalt and these uh, fruit trees coming out, butterflies, script, and underglazed red decoration here and here, which you don't see often on these. It is a t it is, this is a case where the underglazed red turned a little bit brown, but that's iron red, underglazed iron red decoration. Quite nicely done. Bits of grid 
grit and so forth as you often see on these Japanese market pieces. Uh, estimated fairly reasonably, two to 4,000 euros, but it's got a, a broad color palette on it, which makes it desirable, makes it more desirable. And then over here for this, this is really terrific. We were talking a bit before um, about the uh, Wan Lee uh, patterns and so forth. And this is a transitional period box for the Japanese market. This is a very rare thing. Um, and and, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of surprised the estimate was so low because the Japanese uh, uh, boxes made in, in, uh, for, for the Japanese market and transitional wares and only wares are, are fairly rare. And this is a very delicate small box with its original Japanese uh, uh, wooden box. And uh, there's the end pattern, which you've seen many times on Chinese porcelain. And what's interesting, with it, what the artist did when he was decorating it, he included this archaic pattern that you often see on the rim decorations of Wan Li plates. All right, so it kind of makes me wonder if this isn't a Wan Lee plate instead of a transitional period box. Uh, they have it listed up as, I think, transitional period. Um, uh, I don't know. I, I, I think that might be a bit older. I'm, I'm, Rob is very good on this. I just, I just, with that pattern and that style, it, it looks to me that it may well be Wan Lee and not transitional, uh, which is even more interesting. But look at the estimate here. Um, six to, six to 1200 euros if you're a, if you buy rare things you really want to check this auction out because i think there's some great forms in here then and maybe they'll maybe one or two of them will go under the radar with the estimates all right and then over here to this 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 yu tang jai chi marked shunzi transitional period charger now this is not a saucer though it looks like one the shape is a, a form that's most often associated most typically with 18th century saucers for the export market this is actually like a shallow bowl here's a side shot of it and uh, it is big this thing is 35 centimeters in diameter and it's got this terrific scene um, here of um, immortals coming to the to, coming to the to, coming to the edge of the of the pond the lake they're beneath the pine trees and they're all carrying precious objects scrolls and rue scepters and peaches and then the, uh, the mythical double gourd vase with the uh, dream coming out of it and uh, more precious object root carvings so forth instruments and whatnot it's very unusual and it is marked on the back which is which is very cool because m very few uh, transitional pieces are marked. They didn't typically mark them, but uh, the estimate is eight to twelve thousand euros because it's it's reflective of the rarity of the piece again, um, uh, but. Uh, highly unusual. He says it's had a little bit of uh, rim repair. I suspect they probably colored in some of the fritting. So check it out uh, before you bid. But uh, that's typically what happens. Um, uh, in, especially 100 years ago, they, the, the fritting really bothered people. So they would take them to ceramic restores and have a little tiny spot filled in. And then they'd overspray the whole thing and make a mess of it. And um, I've had vases where the entire neck, the last six inches of a vase, has been painted uh, to cover up uh, a one inch hairline at the mouth. It's weird. Okay, and now let's uh, mosey on over to this. This is another one of the things I think is terrific because it has an animal form and I love animal forms in Chinese art. But this is a very nice uh, transitional period uh, uh, Wukai jar with this great Fu Lion on it. And you see the same kind of Fu Lion often put on a, a little bit later on underglazed blue on Kangxi jars. It's very typically uh, these large scale Fu Lions. Here you see it on a transitional piece. It's nicely, nicely done. I love how they did the underglazed blue into the body and then use overglaze enamels to fill in around it in this very delicately placed aubergine outline to sort of highlight the whole thing. Just nicely done and I love the facial expression with his eyes darting over to the over to his left and these his teeth coming out, these big ferocious teeth and so forth. Very nicely done with a lid. All right, a lot of these jars, as many of you know, you, you get them and they never have their lids because they, you know, they get dropped and broken throughout their lifetime and so forth. And there's a nice looking iron red balustrade and rocks and all kinds of plants and so forth. Very nicely done with a four to eight thousand euro estimate, which is right in the right in there. These these, you know, the, the average should see jar transitional period jar. This is what they, you know, they typically sell for, you know, five to seven thousand dollars if they're in good shape with a lid. So that's not a bad estimate at all for that. It's perfectly reasonable. And then over here onto this page, this is the Kangxi section. We click that off here, and you'll notice right off the bat, there's a whole bunch of good Yixing Kangxi ware uh, teapots 
and whatnot on here, and plates, all right? And we're going to take a look at a couple of them in a minute. And there's some nice monochrome, some aubergine pieces, uh, nice double gourd, bottle vases, and so on and so forth. This very nice square handle with a green green handle, square-handled uh, wine pot uh, or, 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 or gilt teapot. Um, the only real difference between gilt uh, teapots and wine pots is that the, the teapot has a pierced uh, entryway for the pourer to go through to trap the tea to keep it from going out when you pour. Wine pots tend not to have those. And sometimes that's about the only difference. All right, one of the things I wanted to throw in here, again, another piece of wood. I, I know some of you wonder why. i just obsessed with old wood and old carved things like this. And this is a terrific little carved coconut, pewter-mounted um, um, Ming um, uh, wine ewer. Just beautiful, you know, I mean, Kangxi wine ewer. And uh, if you bring it up, you'll see how, how well done it is. And I think what it really is, is it looks to me like the, the, the lid is fitted with a, with a piece of coconut, of course. This looks like an up, that upside down cup that was, uh, or a cup form. And they, the, what they did was they, they carved it so it would be made into a teapot. Obviously, otherwise this would be upside, all of this work here would be upside down. Uh, but then they, they, but they did it the way they did cups. And then they, they flipped it, did the carving and then mounted it with pewter. Just absolutely terrific. And it looks like it's in very good shape for something this old, this fragile. Estimated at one to 2,000 euros, which again, I think is very reasonable. And it measures about 17 centimeters tall or about seven inches in height. These are not big, uh, but very delicate, very personal. Great little table object. If you collect scholars and table objects, um, this is something you want to check out. And he does provide a link to uh, a sale that uh, Sotheby's had uh, where they had a couple of them a few years ago. And they were estimated way up there, 170 to 200,000 Hong Kong or uh, roughly, uh, you know, 20, 30,000, 20, 25,000 dollars. Uh, for two of them. Uh, but this one is, is equally nice, and I think it's, it's, it's a great little object. If you're a scholar's object buyer, you really want to check this out. And then on to this, this copper uh, red powder blue uh, Kangxi dish. And if you, if you recognize it, it's because you probably have the Rijksmuseum book. And I believe this is on the cover. I think I have that book here, don't I? I have it here somewhere. Uh... Yep, got it. Here it is. All right, if you don't have this book, mine is a little dog-eared because I've had it for so long, but it's by Christian Jorg. And if you don't have this book, get it. It's a great little book. Um, I, I met Christian years ago, in 1999 when this came out. There it is. He came by to visit us and uh, with Bill Sargent from the Peabody, and he, was, he signed my book for me. There it is. How about that? At any rate... Um, it's a handy book. I've used it a million times. And uh, this plate is, like I said, it's on the cover of their book of the Rijksmuseum collection, which is one of the great Chinese porcelain and, and great museums in the world. At any rate, uh, you really want to check this plate out of the, of the figure walking with the underglaze. Notice on this, too, is, is how well done the underglaze red is. It stayed in nicely. It didn't turn brown. And the facial expression on the man is just great. All right, and they have an explanation of who he is. There's, there's a number of theories. Um, they have, you know, of, of who he is and so far, so forth. Um, and it's sort of a controversial thing. But at any rate, he's estimated the plate at eight, six to twelve thousand euros, which I think is fine. It's about eight inches in diameter. But again, rare type, rare. The sale has lots of great rarities. And I'm going to tell you, I don't think the estimates are at all crazy on this stuff. Then on to this. This is a very rare, again rare, uh, uh, seated Buddha um, uh, Kung Shi period incense burner with script. And uh, you'll see on this, there's a, there's a different Buddha um, on each, each quadrant going around it. Uh, beautifully done snow white porcelain, beautifully done foot rim on it. Uh, here's a shot of it done in natural light. I like the fact that Rob does this. He shoots them in, in, in under the studio lights and he gets some natural light on them. So you get a, a real good sense of exactly what it would look like in person. All right, you get to see both views. And uh, estimated at 15 to 25,000 uh, euros, but not unreasonable. That's what they're worth. Uh, and this is a nice one. And it's beautifully potted. The potting on this was particularly good. You can get distracted because the artwork is so good on it. The quality of the cobalt is so good on it. But also pay attention to the potting. The potting on this thing is absolutely lovely. Um, shape matters. And then again, onto this, a Kangxi, uh, 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 Femi Ver uh, 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 vase 
Rulu vase with uh, f f figures on the outside. I love I love the facial expressions on these guys. Again, you have the the, the immortal with the double gourd. Uh, emitting the uh, sending up the dream and then the descending red-headed there's the red-headed uh, heron um, with another immortal carrying a rue scepter coming down and so on lots of activity on here if you're into into buddhist art and uh, and buddhist representations and nomenclature all that stuff this is a vase you might be very interested in buying it's 43 centimeters tall estimated at 15 to 25,000 euros which is right in the sweet sweet spot range for these rulu vases it's good size and it has interesting subject matter and I wanted to point this out this is a really great scene you see how how, how dense the, the green is when they did the pine trees the pine trees on here is really lovely and they did the tree itself with aubergine which is great all right it's just very very attractive very simple very elegant down that side like it a lot all right now let's see what's this one here Oh, the pair of vases. Yeah, look at these. These are great. Underglaze blue, um, overglaze enameled, pair of Rulu vases, 42 centimeters tall. So they are, you know, what? Um, um, uh, how many inches is that? 30, 30, 35 inches, 36 inches in height, something like that. Good size. Uh, but they have interesting hunting scenes on them. And one of them, here he is. He's, he's just fired his bow, and he's got himself a deer. And then, he, then this one is a repeat, but a different colored horse. All right, so they alternated the color patterns. Very nice enameling on this. You have the Buddhist bells and uh, pendants hanging down the sides and then coming in. They're all draping off of these lotus-tipped uh, edges, which, of course, are, uh, you know, from the, from the lotus plant arising uh, with Buddha from the, from the Sea of Muck. And uh, they used it here just to show it so beautifully. And uh, very nicely composed pair and a pair of vases. And it's always good to remember that, you know, generally speaking, pairs are worth three times the price of a single. So they have a pair of them here, 15 to 25,000 euros. And you say to yourself, well, what, what is one of these vases worth? And you're going to say easily six to $8,000. All right. So uh, the, the estimate on here, again, is quite reasonable. Um, um, Marchant had a very similar pair, apparently, about uh, 12, 13 years ago over in London. All right, so you can go and compare. Always check Rob's listing. He does put in links to other things. And then on to this. This is a very cool plate. Uh, this is uh, uh, the Ji uh, Jiang Ji temple scene um, uh, with, a, with, a, with a Jai Jing mark, but it's Kang Shi period. All right, and this particular bowl was illustrated in Stephen Little's book on transitional wares, uh, which was one of the early, early books on transitional porcelain. And this is a scene from the, from the Western Palace, uh, Western Chamber, rather. And there's a whole write-up on it in, in here, Romance of the Western Chamber scene. And down here is the bowl. The bowl is in the book, and they shared the book. And this is the collection that came from a Mason Wine Collection, Potomac, Maryland. And there's a long write-up about it because it's an important historic sort of piece. Here's a daylight photo of it. Uh, it was sold, up, I think, a few years ago, right? Four or five years ago at Christie's Hong Kong. It was sold, um, uh, um, acquired from uh, uh, Feng Chun Ma, Chinese and Japanese art before that. At any rate, this, this is the piece that had been exhibited at the Kimball Art Museum and so on and so forth. But just a, a wonderful dish with a great history of a rare pattern. Um, if you collect uh, these uh, uh, Kang Shi pieces, uh, you're going to have to look around for a while before you find this scene on another piece of porcelain because it wasn't done much, all right? And uh, But it did turn up on transitional and Kang Shi pieces. He has it listed as Kang Shi, but I, I, I tend to think it's more likely a little bit earlier than Kang Shi transitional. But at any event, 15 to 25,000 euros, very rare, uh, again, uh, with a history. So I, Rob really knocked it out of the park this time around, I have to say. And then here, this Kangxi period reticulated wine pot, uh, a very, very pretty example, nice color, top quality uh, carving and potting on it. Uh, here you have the uh, little prunus blossoms, and you have these sort of chimera, archaic looking chimeras running around the neck, and then the lid. Nice looking spout dragon mask with a, with a square spout coming from his mouth. No chips, hardly. There's a tiny microscopic nick there. Could have been done at the time it was made. That is a firing line in the pot. That's not damaged. It's a good piece. It's a good, nice looking pot. There's a great profile of it. Notice the balance, the profile, uh, the, the handle to the spout, the lid to the bottom, and then the reticulated panel. It's all very nicely done. Estimated at two to 4,000 euros, which is right in there. I wouldn't be surprised to see that go well over that amount, but we'll see. 
And then this, the Chinese Amari style teapots with their covers. Um, and I like him, the fact that he points out with covers because these faceted teapots in particular were so prone to chipping and cracking and not having their covers because people often misalign where the hand, where this lid fits on here because it usually only fits one way comfortably and they people bang them together and then they crack them, the handle breaks and that's the end of that. This one still has both and uh, it's in wonderful shape. The enameling on it looks very, very, very good. Uh, the spouts are beautifully potted. There's a tiny bit of fritting here on the edge of the spout. Probably the same on the other one, a uh, tiny bit at the bottom of the spout. There we go. But still very, very nice with underglazed blue gilding and Amari red all over it. Beautiful pair of pots with their original lids, estimated at five to $10,000, which is about right for one, a pair of these. And these are pretty good size. These are eight inches tall each. These aren't little tiny four or five inch wine pods or teapots. These are good size. They're eight, nine inches in height. And it's a pair. Again, power of a pair. <clears throat> and then on to this. This is a beast of a bowl. This is like a 13 or 14 inch bowl, uh, size of a charger, Kangxi period, of course, with these beautifully molded uh, lotus uh, uh, panels around the sides and then all filled in very, very nicely with a high quality, deep cobalt, sapphire looking blue. And one of the things I noticed on this here, we'll get to it in a second, that notice the line across the top here, um, very straight. There's no warpage, there's no bend, there's no anything. These Kung Shi pieces, transitional pieces, late Ming pieces, when they got into these great big bowls, which, which, which can easily start to, start to warp off in the kiln, they sometimes are uh, uh, slightly tilted. Um, and it's not, it's, not, it's not a big knock on them because it happened all the time, but because they're also thinly made. They're not like vases and jars where they're a bit thicker and they tend to hold up better uh, the bigger they get. These were fairly, th <clears throat> fairly thinly potted. And uh, I noticed that this one seems to sit beautifully straight all the way around. There's another shot of it. There's another shot of it. Nice and straight. And then the interior of this is just elegant. You have this nice big cavetta with these rocky scenes with trees coming out of them. And they're encircling this inner scene of, uh, of rocks and flowers and, and uh, chrysanthemums in a pairing of birds, one perched and one ascending. And then this, then all framed by these alternating cartouches filled in with diaper patterns. It's just a great package. And uh, I think the estimate is very low. Um, get a condition report on this, because three to 6,000 euros? Um, seems to me a few weeks ago, we saw a uh, seven or eight inch Kangxi bowl similar to this sell for about seven or 8,000 euros. Um, I think this could be a terrific buy for somebody. This thing is charger size, it's like that. It's a great big bowl, very nice. And then over to this, this is a uh, Aftaba. Uh, uh, you're going to see this word used more and more. I notice Rob is using it, which is actually the correct thing, word to use. It's basically, it's an Islamic and Northern Indian metal form that we use as water pourers, uh, mostly for ablutions and for religious ceremonies and so forth. And um, this is a very nice one. He's got two of them. He's got one here in, in, in enamels and this one in underglazed blue. Uh, very unusual. Uh, very unusual form, very unusual type. These were all made for the either, like, as I said, n the North India, the Indian market, or made for Persia uh, and the Middle East and so forth as, a, as an export good. And uh, this one is a dandy example. He's got it dated as Kangxi. Could be a little bit older, but regardless, it's absolutely great. And I think the estimate's okay, two to 4,000 euros. Okay, now over here to this, this is the uh, Yong Chen section, because you, you know, you gotta have a Yong Chen section after all. And uh, he's got some nice, nice pieces in here. There's only uh, four pages of them <laughs> that you could go through. Uh, but a couple of them caught my attention right off the top. The first one, of course, is the Governor Duff dish. Um, this is a famous export pattern. And I, I like this one in particular because the condition is, looks to be so good on it. Uh, a lot of, there are a number, quite a few Governor Duff dishes come in and out of the market every year. But the problem is they're often always, they often have a lot of wear in here, in the middle, because the clothing and the robes, there's a lot of gilding here. You notice is, is, is the, the jacket of the European is outlined in, in, in gold, and there's gold highlights through his hat and all this, and that's often long gone and rubbed off. Um, and in this one, it looks to be in quite good condition. The leaves here are all nicely, the lotus leaves are all nicely uh, covered. Uh, all the, the gilding looks good, and I don't see any noticeable wear to the enamels. This red enamel often gets sort of thin and light pink in places from when it wears through. This is not wear. That's the way they colored it naturally. 
All right, but you'll notice that the, the enamels all look to be in good shape and uh, quite a rare plate. And uh, it is estimated, it's got a modest estimate of 2,500 to 5,000 euros. <clears throat> but if, if, you, if you know about these, these young early uh, export plates, uh, they're sort of like the pronk wares, so to speak. Um, they uh, tended to uh, um, not make a lot of them, and they tended to be used, and they tended to get worn out. All right, and then on to this, the Yong Chen to Chin Lung period. These are difficult to date. Dao Sai, 100 boys vase. Uh, the 100 boys pattern, of course, started uh, back in the, in the Ming Dynasty and became always popular going forward with blessings for a big family and so forth. And here they are with the Dragon Festival, playing with the dragons. It's interesting. I think the video two weeks ago we closed. We had we had a uh, uh, a scene uh, that was filmed in in um, Hong Kong in the late 40s, early 50s of the Dragon Festival. Well, here it is, and they're they're carrying the dragon around, and the boys are uh, carrying little banners and sticks and rue scepters and vases and firecrackers and all kinds of mischief. Here's one flying a kite, made uh, in the form of a, of a of a butterfly which they did actually do. But the Daosai enamels on this are quite excellent. It's a rare form. And it's either Yong Chen or Chin Lung. And the reason that you really sometimes can't really tell too much because th this type of work, this style of work, uh, didn't change a whole heck of a lot between the sort of the, the, the latter part of the Yong Chen period and the early part of the Chin Lung period. Uh, the, the style remained very consistent. The quality of the work remained very consistent. And this is just a lovely piece. All right, and uh, and you know they, they know this also because Tang Ying, who ran the imperial kiln, this is, wasn't probably made there, but but it was a tradition that when 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 Yong Chen had gone by and he came, Tang Ying went to work for Chin Lung. He continued to make many of the great things that he had made for for for, for Chin Lung's father. All right, so anyway, this is a beautiful pot. It's estimated at fifteen to twenty-five thousand euros, which I think is about right. Seems to me on eBay a few weeks ago, <clears throat> there was a very nice um, a, a Yong Chen jar about this side, equal quality that brought uh, 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 around twenty thousand um, U.S. And it didn't have the Dragon Festival or the Hundred Boys pattern. The Hundred Boys pattern makes a big difference on these, and I love the dragon. All right, and it is thirty-seven meters, thirty-seven centimeters tall without the uh, wooden lid. It has a later fitted wooden lid here. All right. And you can look at the daylight pictures as well. And then hopping on over to here, we have a couple of uh, pieces. This is in the, in, in, in the vase section. There's some very good vases in if you're a vase buyer. There's also uh, two pairs of massive rose mandarin vases. Uh, I think they're 130 centimeters a piece. Go, go dig in and find them. They are super duper. And um, they're very big. They're over four feet tall. Um, 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 Four, four and a half feet tall each, which is very, very big for these. We always talk about vases that are, you know, 36 inches and so forth. These are over 50 inches, six, 55 inches tall pairs of vases. And the estimates, I think, are okay. But at any rate, I wanted to share this. Uh, we'll start with this one, the, uh, the, uh, the, the Ming Dynasty Long Quan Celadon, probably 14th or 15th century, early 15th, 15th century, I guess, would be the date on this. Um, uh, very nicely done, Three Friends of Winter mold relief uh, vase. And the shape of this vase is just terrific. Love the narrow, narrow, narrow foot, and then it splays out. Uh, nice, nice looking edge on there. <clears throat> and what's interesting about this is the form and shape because it's 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 a very swollen, very exaggerated, and then squishes into that tight little maping mouth. Uh, beautifully done, and it's 40 centimeters tall. So this is about a 16 inch, 16 or so inch vase, um, which is very desirable. Has an eight to twelve thousand uh, euro estimate, and I like it. And then the next vase up is the copper red Meiping vase, Chin Lung Market period. Uh, very nice example. And you've seen these before. These vases can vary wildly in price uh, um, because I've had people call me and they have one and they think, it, is it like the one that like Sotheby's and Christie's have each had this form? And they can sell for upwards of $100,000. 120,000 even uh, mark and period and but they came in a wide range of, 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 of types and styles and qualities of glazes so you have to be very sensitive when examining these this is a very nice one um, it is uh, more of a liver red color again if you look at it without the uh, without the studio lights this is closer to the color um, uh, very nicely done very even nice looking white lip around the around the mouth and has a, a, a chin lung mark on the bottom, which is, it is a mark and period vase. I don't think it was made at the Imperial Kiln. I think it's a very nice uh, example, though, in copper red, May Ping, about 9 or 10 inches tall, uh, 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 b beautifully done all in general all the way around. 
I think there's a tiny bit of, a little bit of rubbing and scratching on the glazes, on the glaze, which is typical for these. But he's got a very reasonable estimate, 10 to 20,000 euros on this, okay? And I don't think that's unreasonable. I, I, I sort of expect it to bring in the, in the 15 to 20,000 euro range. We'll see. Uh, but it is a nice one, and it's not been repaired. Which is, which is nice, because often the mouths of these May Ping bases get bashed around. And then over here to the Japanese stuff, there's not a huge amount of Japanese material, but what there is, it's terrific. Um, here, if, if you like Sumida, uh, Sumida Gawa vases, this is something you want to look at. This is not, this is a, a Meiji period example. This is one of the best Sumida Gawa vases I've seen in years. Um, if you like this kind of work, it's very cool, it's very festive, lots of kids climbing up, uh, there they are. Um, uh, riding along the uh, broken out edge and then the monkeys and all that. It's just terrific. These, these things I think are so underappreciated in the market. It's just crazy. I think these are wildly fun and a uh, nice looking example with a four to 800 euro estimate. How can you go wrong? And this isn't as big. This thing is about 17 inches tall. All right, uh, 18 inches tall. This is a big vase. A lot of Sumida, people think of Sumida Gawa pieces always being five to seven inches tall. This is a big, big piece. All right. And then moseying over to uh, here is the Edo period um, uh, screen. Uh, lacquer work on it, nicely done, about, about 10 inches in diameter. Beautiful quality. Here we go. And uh, the estimate on it is perfectly fine. Four to 800 euros for a nice piece of Japanese work. And then there's this. This, I think, is the steel. Okay, I love this. This is a uh, late Edo, early Meiji period uh, example of Manju riding a shishi. And the form, this form and style, you typically think of as being, um, you, know, uh, you know, six or seven inches tall, sits, sits, uh, long rather, would sit on a table. This thing is enormous. This thing is 50 centimeters long. I think it was like 59 centimeters, 59 centimeters long. So it's basically 23 inches in width and uh, roughly 18 inches tall. This is a great big carving with lacquer work on it, top quality. Love the facial expression of the Foo Lion. Love that. <laughs> he looks wild. Nice, nice work all the way up. Pigment and uh, good looking lacquered, very, very uh, calm face and so forth with an eight to 1200 euro estimate. I would, I would, if you're a Japanese buyer, boy, I'd look into that. I'd look into that, that would make a room. And then over here to this is a Japanese Edo period Shoko Omari rectangular box and cover. Uh, very rare form tape, taken uh, from, from later Ming forms, uh, but a nice looking box. Looks to be in rather good condition from what I can see with uh, immortal scenes on the, on the lid. And that's a slide out lid, by the way. Get back to that for a second. Come on, come on, get back around. Okay, there's the interior for the, the pens and so forth to go inside of. Um, and, uh, but I love the, uh, the lid and of course this, this intersection slides out over here. And that's how that works. But at any rate, um, estimated 1,500 to 2,500 euros for a very rare piece of Arita, 17th century Arita. Nice looking thing. I think it's 17th century. It certainly looks at it. Ask Rob if you call. Say, how old do you think it is? I think that's probably what it is. It says Edo period. They left it a little bit vague because they're hard to date. It's just a flat piece of porcelain, but beautifully done. And then for this, the big Japanese Amari teapot and cover, Edo period, 17th century. And what I noticed about this that was kind of fun was they did something sort of whimsical with the, uh, the handle and the spout. You notice on this side, the handle... It has this uh, white ground with a red stripe running through it, and here it's just a blue stripe, but you can see the red stripe on the face of it. They, they sort of flipped it. They sort of, sort of flipped the script on the decoration. Here's the back of the handle, and then you have the other side where the white in the, in the, in the, uh, the white body with the red line and the, in the white area with the red line are aligned with each other. But on the other side, they sort of flipped it a little bit. And I think that's kind of cool. And I like the fact that it's faceted. It has a faceted body, nice looking foot on it, nicely done, beautifully recessed all the way up inside like that. Here it is, that, that bluish glaze that you see on Arita pieces and so forth. A, lot, a bit of iron oxide appearing. And uh, <clears throat> let me see, there it is. And also the fitted cup form lid. Um, uh, this, this type of lid, of course, it really started out during the Ming Dynasty 
and on on yuan vases you'll see these Meiping vases with the cup cup cover on them and here the Japanese have adopted it onto this piece of Amari and how big is it 28 centimeters so it's about 9 to 10 inches tall 1,000 to 2,000 euro estimate not terrible price at all and then you have the Delft material at the end which is also worth looking at particularly for examples that emulate Japanese and Chinese things like these like these Dutch Delft uh, door vases 18th century they're clearly copying um, uh, Chinese and Japanese uh, things during the Shinwazari craze uh, this vase here they're copying Ming examples and so forth all right and the jars all right but that's Rob's sale it's a couple of days as I said it runs on the uh, on the, uh, 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 the the 13th and the 14th of March this month over in Bruges they're gonna start it I believe at 9 o'clock in the morning their time normally they start at 10 but they made a little bit of change in their schedule but get ahead of it if you want to bid on something there get in touch with them now so you're not rushing in the last two days because they get very very busy as all auction houses do in the, in the day day or so leading up to a sale Get your information, get registered, and, uh, uh, you know, carpet bomb this auction with bids because there's some great things in here. And if you get any of them, a lot of them, if you can get them sort of in the lower end of the estimates, you really did well. All right. He, he's, he's not rough on estimates uh, very often because unless the consigner is overly aggressive, but uh, that's something every auctioneer deals with. But he, he's very careful to put in good estimates, and I think this looks like a very nice auction. All right. Have a great week, and we'll be back later with some uh, uh, our regular videos and so on and so forth. Okay, subscribe if you enjoy these. Okay, bye-bye.